Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter. And beginning there again with our scripture reading. Second Peter chapter 1 and beginning with verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. So that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection or brotherly love and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities, In increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble, and you'll receive a rich welcome into eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's message is the second message of a series of three, three-part series. Peter wrote these words to us in his final letter. He wanted us to know that no matter how dark or dangerous the world may seem, God's power has everything that we need for a life of godliness. God isn't daunted by the signs of the times around you. His divine power, there's enough energy for our life with a billion volts of grace. What do you say? Just waiting for us. The Lord conveys this amazing power to us through his promises. Strengthened by those promises, you fulfill his purpose as you grow in these essential qualities. Peter reveals a series of blessings waiting for us. Peter's final message has seven marvelous blessings. Blessing one is God's maturity godly maturity. After Peter lists these eight qualities in verses 5 to 7, he writes, for if these things are yours and abound. Peter wanted those early Christians to more than just have faith. He wanted them to devote devote themselves to growing deeper, wider, richer in their faith. And that's what he wants for each one of us. To be growing deeper, wider, and richer. An abundant faith. Some of Peter's final words were, Grow in the faith and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At times in, during the Jesus ministry, Peter's life seemed the most immature of the disciples. But by the end of Peter's life, He had a profound spiritual maturity and was ready to disclose the secret, how he had acquired it. It was because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. It was Jesus and the process that unleashed in Peter's life since their very first encounter. It's the process that Peter outlines for us here in 2 Peter chapter 1. The passage we're looking at only has four sentences, and Peter used the words, these things, in three of them. These things refer to all the traits listed, diligence, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Peter said, all of these things can belong to you and to me. 
we can take possession of them, and they can take possession of each one of us. God needs mature people in an immature world. Maturity comes with time and experience. As it develops, it gives you a vision that takes you beyond where you are today. And I want to give a word of caution at the very beginning. Don't confuse maturity with perfection. Qualities that lead to maturity are ever-expanding, ever-increasing. You'll never perfect them here on earth. No matter how much knowledge you have, there's always more to tap into. No matter, how much, no matter how much perseverance you have, you develop, you can become more resilient. Many times at the end of the year, as I come down to December and facing January in a new year, I stop and take, take an inventory of the last year. Where I've been, what I've done, what I've learned, what I've accomplished, and where I've failed, where I didn't accomplish some of the things that I wanted to, where some of the things I did that I didn't want to do. There's always areas where I can always do better, but I can track spiritual growth. As I look back on the last year, as I look back on the last five years, as I look back on the last 10 years, as I look at my life since I became a Christian, I thank God for what he's done in my life. And I realize there's still a lot of work left to be done. Aren't you glad that he doesn't give up? that is ever there waiting, waiting, just waiting for us to give him a chance. How are you doing in the maturity department as we look in 2022? How mature is your faith, your joy, your patience, your wisdom in handling difficulties your instincts in making wise decisions. What about godliness? We don't like to think about being godliness, but the Bible talks about it. Godliness is becoming more Christ-like. What we do, what we say, what we are, even what we think. Don't be discouraged. Be diligent. Let these qualities abound in you. And in the process, maturity happens. Blessing number two is growing productivity. 2 Peter 1.8 goes on to say, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Putting this in the positive, if you possess these qualities and grow in them, you'll be increasingly effective and productive in whatever you do for Jesus. Each one of us here this morning, those that are watching online, each one of us have unique gifts, talents, and blessings from the Lord, assets for God's kingdom. Passion, opportunities. And the key to productivity in the Christian ministry is to be diligent in developing a godly character in your life. As God works in you, developing you into a mature believer, he'll then work through you so you can be a blessing to others. Each one of us that have been given gifts, those gifts are never given to us for us. The gifts are always given that it will become a blessing for others. I want you to stop and think about that. Any unique gifts that you have and talents 
They're not given for you. They're given to you so that you can be a blessing to others and share with others. I want to tell you a story about Rodney Smith. How many have ever heard of Rodney Smith? That's what I thought. He came from Bermuda to Alabama for schooling, but he was having a hard time deciding what he wanted to do with his life. He said, I prayed that God would use me as a vessel. You know, you need to be careful when you pray. Are you aware of that? You need to be careful when you pray. God will hear your prayer, and he'll answer it. I remember one time when Karen and I were coming from the seminary, we were heading up to Alaska, where we were involved in ministry, and I was pastoring there in the Anchorage Church. And as we were going through mid-America, I remember Karen saying, man, I'm sure glad the Lord will never send us to this place. <laughs> never, ever say that. We left Alaska and went to Wisconsin. And we left Wisconsin and went to Oregon. And we left Oregon and we went to mid-America. The very place that Lord Karen was thankful that the Lord would never send us. Be careful what you pray. Be careful what you wish. God's listening. And I have good news. God's answering. What do you say? That's why it's so important to join us on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. The hour of power. Just one hour. 60 minutes. Well, I want to tell you about Rodney. He came from Bermuda to Alabama for schooling, but he was having a hard time making up his mind what he wanted to do with his life. He said, I prayed that God would use me as a vessel. One day he was driving down the street and saw an elderly man struggling to cut his grass. Rodney stopped and helped him finish the job and when he said, when I was driving away, I was amazed at how good that felt, and I truly believed that God was speaking to me. So as I was finishing up my computer science degree, I would find widows, veterans, disabled, elderly people, people that just got out of the hospital. People that needed to have their grass cut and just do it for them for free. He said, I couldn't believe how it touched them. So many of these people had lost a lot of joy in their lives. More than cutting the lawn, I'd spend time listening to their stories. You know, you can hear, learn an awful lot if you just take time to listen because everybody has a story to tell. It wasn't just a matter of taking care of the yard. It was showing them that they matter and that God cares for them. Rodney started recruiting other kids from the city, encouraging them to take care of lawns, raking leaves in the fall, and shoveling snow in the winter. He gave T-shirts to any kids, any young person, who would take care of ten lawns. If they did 50 lawns, he gave them a free lawnmower. Rodney's unique ministry provides lawn care and loving fellowship to single moms, elderly people, disabled vets, and many others. It also takes young men off the street, mentors and trains them and teaches them for their, their power of giving themselves to a cause. Today his ministry is Raising Men Lawn Care Service. has helped nearly 300 young boys and girls working throughout the United States. Rodney travels all across the country, cutting lawns, giving talks about how God can use us to help others. God can use us to help others. 
Rodney's story illustrates this principle. Spiritual growth is the father of spiritual productivity. This is what Peter promised. The New Living Translation of 2 Peter verse one, chapter 1, verse 8 says, puts it this way. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful, useful you will be. If we have 150 maturing Christians here in this church, that's got the potential for 150 ministries of helping other people. You don't need to look behind you or beside you or the person in front of you. You need to look at the person sitting in your seat that can be part of God's answer to helping someone else. Each of us can be productive and fruitful as we develop the qualities that Peter described. And no matter how long we live, no matter how old we are, we never outgrow this principle. Psalms 92 says, they shall still bear fruit in their old age. Pastor Don and I are thankful for that promise. Aren't you? For as long as we live, we can be fruitful. For as long as we live, we can make an impact, a positive impact for the kingdom. Blessing number three is greater clarity. The third blessing that comes with the development of these eight virtues is greater clarity. 2 Peter 1 verse 9 says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. Short-sighted people have trouble seeing how to live, how to speak, how to act, what values to hold, what opinions to express. They're blinded by immaturity. And the devil, the devil does all he can. Sometimes we're very cooperative with him. The devil doesn't have to work very hard for some of us. They're blinded by spiritual truths needed to function properly. Have you, how many have ever been fitted for glasses? How many are here that have not been fitted, but you probably should be? It's kind of like hearing aids. How many here have hearing aids? How many here should have hearing aids? Wives pointing to the husband, you know. The last time I visited an optometrist, I sat down in a chair in a darkened room, and he pulled a large device that looked like a complicated set of interlocking binoculars. Placing my chin on the pad, I looked through the lens, and everything looked blurred. As he turned the wheel, I heard a click. Is that better or worse, he would say. And click by click, things became clear until I could read every letter. Based on the gradual process, he knew my prescription. The eight qualities that Peter lists here in 2 Peter are just like those lens. Click by click. Jesus clarifies your vision as we mature. Bit by bit, you're able to read the handwriting on the, of his will. You're able to trace the letters of his grace. You're able to discern the times and know how to act. You're able to interpret the details and see things in context, in the context of his word. The word clarity means seeing things as they are, not as we wish them to be. It also means seeing things by faith and understanding that God is working things out for our good. This is the constant drumbeat in Scripture. Psalm 119 says, Open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things from your law. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. As our eyes are open to God's word, working through all the details of our life, we're like the psalmist who said, this was the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. It's like Joan saying, is Isaiah 
and the verse that was there. The return of Jesus comes into increasing focus as we grow in him. Peter's short letter is filled with information about the second coming. The subject occupies most of his last chapter. Three times in 2 Peter 3, we're told to look forward to the Lord's return. That's anticipation. That's clarity about the present and the future. What a blessing. When Ronald Reagan was a child, he was badly nearsighted. But he didn't know it. Neither did his parents. Nobody else did. He saw the world as a blur. One day when he was 13 or 14, his father took the family for a Sunday drive through green countryside outside of Dixon, Illinois. Regan was, tells the story, he was sitting in the back seat and noticed that his mother, Nell, had left her eyeglasses on the seat and picking them up, he picked them up and put them on. Then he said, the next instant I let out a yelp that almost caused my father to run off the road. Nobody was, knew what I was yelling about, but I discovered a world that I didn't know existed. Until then, a tree beside the road looked like a green blob, and a billboard was a fuzzy haze. Suddenly, I was able to see branches on the trees, leaves on the branches. There were words as well as pictures on the billboards. Look, I shouted, pointing to a herd of grazing dairy cows I hadn't seen before. I was astounded by picking up my mother's glasses, and I had discovered that I was extremely nearsighted. A new world opened up to me. And let me tell you, as we grow in the grace of Christ, our vision becomes increasingly clear. One of those ways is to turn into the hour of power on Wednesday night. In our prayer line in the morning that Karen and I have been on now for some period of time, we heard a horrible story. One of our friends was in the hospital. And had been in the hospital for a number of weeks. Been praying for him. And the Lord's been hearing our prayers. But last week, a horrible thing happened. You know, horrible things can happen in the hospital. The doctor came in to him, no, a doctor came to him during the, during the night, late at night, sat down with him and said he had some bad news to share. That there was cancer throughout his body and he wouldn't be leaving the hospital. Nobody else was with him. The, the doctor left. The problem is the doctor was talking to the wrong patient. It was another man with the same name. Can you imagine laying there in bed knowing that people have been praying for you? The doctor comes up in the middle of the night, doctor you've never seen before, sits down beside you, and informs you that you're, there's cancer throughout your body and you're, you're not going to be leaving the hospital. Then just as quickly, the doctor leaves. What a terrible thing. Jesus is waiting for us to put our trust in him. As you grow in his grace, your vision becomes clear. You see his blessings more quickly. You learn to focus your vision on things unseen, for the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Jesus is waiting for us to put our trust in him. He's always been waiting. His arms are outstretched. Aren't you glad that he doesn't give up? 
He's promised he will finish the work within each one of our lives. He wants to help us to grow in godly maturity, blessing one. To be growing in productivity, blessing two. And to experience greater clarity, blessing three. Next Sabbath, I'm going to share the other blessings. Grateful memory, blessing four. How many are thankful for a grateful memory? Or did you forget? Grateful memory, blessing four. Genuine stability, blessing five. Guaranteed security, blessing six. And glorious eternity, blessing seven. So next week we'll continue our study. I want to tell you, I have a friend so precious, so very dear to me. He loves me with such tender love. He loves me faithfully. I could not live apart from him. I love to feel him nigh, and so we dwell together. My Lord and I, let us pray. Father, how thankful we are for what you do for each one of us. How thankful we are for the Holy Spirit. How thankful we are for the forgiveness of sin. How thankful we are, Father, that you don't give up, that you will finish the work with each one of our hearts. And Father, I pray that you'll bless each and every one here by your Holy Spirit, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Help us to put our trust completely in him. Be ready and willing to go and do whatever you have for us to do. We're longing for that time when it'll all be over and Jesus will be here. Until then, Father, keep us faithful, trusting in you. And use us, help us, Father, to be a blessing to others. Thank you again now for we pray in the wonderful and the powerful and the loving name of Jesus. We're so thankful that you are able and we pray in his wonderful name. Amen.